but when you have repeated eigenvalues, so um, if A as a matrix, let's um, let's start with the the simple case was when you had two. Um, distinct eigenvectors corresponding to one eigenvalue. So when you have lambda, lambda, and zero outside. Right, then we said this is uh, easy case. So there are two eigen, eigenvec eigenvectors, x1, which is 1, 0, and x2, which is 0, 1. So these are linearly independent eigenvectors. For each eigenvector, there is a Solution. So let me write the system again here. X prime equals A X is the system we're interested in, right? And for each of them, there is there is um, let's call it X one of T and X two of T, and that's E to the lambda t, right, times x1, which is, in this case, is just e to the lambda t and 0. And x2, which is e to the lambda t, x2, which is 0, and e to the lambda t. Okay? So you have these two solutions, one for, coming from each eigenvector. And then the solution the general solution is then constant x1 plus another constant x2. Okay? And that's uh, not surprising because if you if you're if you think about what's the actual system when this matrix is lambda lambda zero zero, the system is simply um, x1 or we use x and y, I think we use x and y. x prime is lambda x and y prime equals lambda y. So this is a decoupled system, right? And you have the solution, you know, you can compute the solutions. Uh, x of t is x0 e to the lambda t and y of t is y0 to the lambda t. So you get this also from here, it's C1 e to the lambda t 0 plus C2 0 e to the lambda 2 uh, lambda t so it's C1 C2 times e to the lambda t right? so that's right, it's the same thing as this one you agree? and the constants are determined by initial conditions so that was the easy case, but um, the more complicated cases um, it's still repeated eigenvalues, but A is now lambda, lambda 1, and 0. Okay. The claim is that any, any matrix that has repeated eigenvalues can be um, brought into one of these forms through a change of variables. So we'll see how that's done. Um, but this would be the A is not diagonalizable. If you remember that from linear algebra. And this is the case, of course, when it's just diagonal. But this is a not a diagonal matrix and cannot be diagonalized through any change of variables. And simply, be, simply that's the case when uh, so lambda is repeated eigenvalue, and there was only one, only one um, linearly independent eigenvector. For this matrix, okay. In fact, for this matrix, it's, it's very easy to compute the eigenvector corresponding to lambda. You subtract lambda from A, it's going to be 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. And 
and you can see that 1 and 0 is, this, is the eigenvector corresponding to the eigenvalue lambda. Okay, so you, with, a, with one eigenvector you can create a solution x1, x1 sub, subscript is for x1 of, x1 of t is e to the lambda t x1 right? That's one solution. Why is this a solution? Well, it differentiate and it is going to be lambda times itself. But how about, so what would be would uh, be a second linearly independent solution? How can you construct a second linearly independent solution from this one so that when you take linear combination of the two, you get all solutions. And last time I was, I was just uh, trying to do that. It turns out that um, you need the following thing. So you need to put uh, t e to the lambda t x1. So that you use the same eigenvector. But instead of just e to the lambda t, t, e to the lambda t. But that's not enough. You're going to have to add e to the lambda t times a second eigen, excuse me, a second vector. So this is, so where x2 is such that a x2 minus lambda x2 equals x1. Okay, so let me explain. So x2 is called a generalized eigenvector. Just the name, but in case you've, you've heard about it, eigenvector. So that's uh, how it should be. Now, wh why do we look for x2 in this form? Well, um, there, there are several ways to, reasons. Um, one of them is um, well. Let, let me. Let me interpret this and see how it is it, computed, and then then, then say about why. Um, I can rewrite this equation as a minus lambda identity times x two equals x one. In fact, that's how one um, can can remember this. And The fact that x1 is an eigenvector implies that a minus lambda identity x1 equals what? So x1 is an eigenvector means a uh, a x1 equals equals lambda x1. So a minus lambda identity x1 equals 0, right? So you see, when you, when you find an eigenvector, what do you do? You take, um, you, that's, that's the equation you solve, right? a minus lambda identity times x equals 0, and you find the eigenvector. Well, to find generalized eigenvector, you would uh, 
Of course, you, you will not be able to solve this for x2. x2 will not satisfy this. Instead, you're going to take a minus lambda identity times x2 and set it equal to x1, which is already found. Okay, so here, here's the example. So if a is lambda 1, 0 lambda, we said a minus lambda identity x equals 0 gives 0, 1, 0, 0, x, y equals 0, 0, so y equals 0, right? So that means the only eigenvector is, well, is 1, 0, and then uh, scalar multiples of it. Agree? So now what do we do this? Well, we take this, and now we solve a minus lambda identity x2 equals x1. So we solve for x2. So this looks now 0, 1, 0, 0. It's the same matrix. Multiply to xy equals 1, 0. See? So this implies that what, uh, y equals 1, and that's it. In fact, x can be anything here. Right? Just y has to be stated to be 1. So it means that x2 is, can be anything. So let's, let's just pick one uh, generalized eigenvector. So this 0, 1 is going to solve this equation. Okay, but it's not the only one that solves the equation. Okay? So now let's see, what, what does that uh, second solution look like? So we said it's t e to the lambda t x1 plus e to the lambda t x2, so that's what, that's, uh, what was x1, is 1, 0, so, of course, e to lambda t stays in front, so this is t is 0 plus e to lambda t, 0, 1, so e to lambda t, t and 1, so that's x2. That, that's, the, that's the second, we still haven't shown that there's a solution, but it's, this is what's going to be the candidate for the second linearly independent solution from the first one. Why is it linearly independent solution from the first one? In other words, can it be a, a constant multiple of the other one? Well, the other one was x was just was just this, right? Just slam e to lambda t x one. Well, this certainly has a t times dependence, right? So this cannot be a constant multiple of the other one, unless, of course, I don't know, x one would be zero, but you know, x one is not zero. Okay. So the claim is that this is a linearly independent solution. So this, the, the general solution is has the same structure. So C1, X1, plus C2, X2. So this is C1, E2, lambda, T, X1, plus C2, T, E2, lambda, T, X1, plus e to lambda tx2. Or in this case, it would be uh, what c1 e to lambda t0 plus c2 uh, what is it? t e to lambda t 
you need to lambda t. So it's c1, so basically x of t and y of t, c1 e to the lambda t plus c2 t e to the lambda t and c2 e to the lambda t. And you can you can convince yourselves uh, that this is indeed a different different check. Well, what is this? The system was x prime of t equals y prime of t was lambda one zero lambda, so it's lambda x of t plus y of t, and this was lambda y of t. So do you see the second the equation for for y is clear. Y prime is lambda y, so that gives you e to the lambda t. And then x prime is again linear in x, and y is of this form. So you know method of unitermic coefficients or whatever method to solve for x will give you this. Okay. So what's the best way to kind of uh, remember how to construct this solution when you have repeated eigenvalues? Again, I think the best is to say I'm going to take the one solution coming from the only eigenvector e to lambda t x1 and the second solution I'm going to take it of this form t e to lambda t x1 plus another e to lambda t x2 where x2 comes from that equation is a generalized eigenvector. And the computation that um, that shows that x2 is a solution, so this is t e to the lambda t x1 plus e to the lambda t x2 is quite, uh, that shows is a solution to x prime equals ax. Um, what I was trying to um, to do last time, which but of course I didn't have the. I was trying with this first term and I was trying with that first or second term, but it turns out that you have to have the sum of the two. Um, why? Because what is the derivative? Let's take the derivative of this. So it's going to be e to lambda t x one plus t lambda e to lambda t x one. So that's the product rule, right? on the first term and the second term is lambda e to the lambda t x2 and what do we want to recover at the end? We want to say this is equal to a times x2, right? So we want to say this is a times t e to the lambda t x1 plus e to lambda tx2. So how do we see that this equals that? Look at this term t that has a t in it, right? Is this the same as this term? Well this t, there's e to lambda t. This is a x1 and this is lambda x1 x1 is, an eigen, is the eigenvector, right? Correspond to lambda. So, so in other words, this term equals that, or that term equals this term. How about this term here? A x2, is it equal to the sum of these two terms? So that's right, this is going to be t e to the lambda t a x1. And where these two terms is going to be e to the lambda t x1 plus lambda x2. So again, why is, why is this term equal to this term?
Hmm? What is the sum? Well, it has to be better be a x two. Is it a x two? That's precisely how we define x two to be, or how is x two solves a x two minus lambda x two equals x one, right? So x two is is x one plus lambda x two. Okay. So this this derivative equals a times the solution x two. So so x2 is a solution. And again, we, show, we also said it's linearly dependent from x1 because of the t factor. So take the matrix 0, 1, negative. negative one. Um, no, negative one, negative two. Just so, so it has. Um, what are the eigenvalues? So, a minus lambda identity determinant equals zero. Minus lambda one, minus one minus two minus lambda is zero. Lambda two plus lambda plus one equals zero. Lambda squared plus two lambda plus one equals zero. So lambda plus one squared equals zero. So lambda is negative one is the repeated eigenvalue, right? Yeah. So what do we do now? Find the eigenvector. So. So we take a minus lambda identity times x, well, lambda 1. So this is going to be what's 1, 1, negative 1, negative 1, x, y equals 0. So the only eigenvector is x plus y equals 0. So I can take like negative one and one, right? So that's the that's the eigenvector negative one one, and there's no other linearly independent from this one. And with this eigenvector, we can write one solution to to our, to our system. That's x one of t is e to the minus t negative one one, right? How do we find the second one? Well, first we find this so-called generalized eigenvector. So, it's it's a it's a vector such that a minus lambda identity x two equals x one. Now, is this going to be unique? No, you see anything that if I find an x two and then I add x one to x two, this is also gonna gonna satisfy this. So basically, any any constant multiple of x one added to x two is also gonna be a solution. So let's just find one of them. So one like, kind of the easiest. Uh, of them, what is, what was what was um, one one negative one negative one x y equals negative one one. Okay, so we get x plus y equals negative one, and of course the other equation is going to be same as this one, just with a negative sign. Okay. 
So, what's what's a um, what's a vector that has x plus y equals negative one? Uh, zero and negative one, for instance, right? Not the only one, but that's that's a good that's a good enough. So now we can build this second solution of the differentialist system, saying t e to the lambda t x one. So that's negative one one plus e to the lambda t zero negative one. Okay. So it's what t negative t to lambda t and t to lambda t minus e to lambda t. You can leave it like this, or it's minus t lambda t and t minus one e to lambda t. Oh yes, yes, yes. And I didn't do that. So yeah. So it's negative t and t minus 1, e to the minus t. So that's x2. So what's the general solution? x of t is negative 1, 1, e to the um, e to negative t plus, uh, excuse me, c1 times that plus c2 times this. What's the phase plan going to look like for this? So how, how will solutions look like? Well, the solution that corresponds to the eigenvector, negative 1, 1, negative 1, 1 is here, right? Negative 1, 1. This is going to be straight in, right, towards the origin, because it's e to the minus t, so it's going towards the origin. Yeah. Any other direction in which the solution goes straight towards the origin? No, because it would have to be a different uh, eigenvector. So there's no other eigenvectors. Um, but, you know, given an initial condition, you can compute this constant, C1 and C2, and then plot the solution. Well, I don't know, let's just say which how would the solution look like if C1 is 0 and C2 is 1? So just, just this, this is the x2 solution. How does this look like? See, it's almost like you parameterize the curve. One goes, one is negative t right times this factor and this is t minus 1 so uh, when t is 0 for instance where do you start 0 negative 1 right so it goes 0 negative 1 so it's it's it goes through here and then what happens x gets negative so if this t increases x goes negative but Good, but towards zero, right? So it's, it's it's t to negative t goes to zero. So it's negative, but it goes towards zero. And how about x two? Well, if t is less than one, this is negative. But if t is greater than one, this is positive. So it's going to go. Th y is going to go po get positive. So the solution is going to look like this towards the origin, right? Roughly, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, right? I mean, uh, well, let's let's see. X of t is negative t to the negative t 
and y is o of t is t minus 1 e to the minus t. Um, that's just a curve in the plane. I mean, it's parameterized by these things. Sometimes you cannot find a... I mean, this is not going to be a parabola, right? Or anything. It's just given by this parameterization. The best you can do is you can um, plot, you know, you can look at the... I mean, let's see, can you simplify something? Can you get rid of t? I don't think so. You see, the only the only time when you have a parametric curve in the plane, you want to uh, represent plot it. You're hoping that you can get rid of t, solve for t, and I mean get rid of t and just get x as a function of y or y as a function of x. But you can see here, neither x, you know, this is not a graph of a function. So you could you could try something implicit. Sometimes you can write an implicit equation for x and y, but not, you know, in this case you can't. Uh, I think you cannot get rid of t just because of this, you know, exponentials and polynomials in front. So that that's how that's how basically that's how the solution x2 looks like, and that's how the solution I don't know x1 looks like. But it's not so critical, it's not so important that you know we know what x2 looks like, but how is this linear combination you know eventually looking like for all solutions? So I don't know, just take another value for c1 and c2. I mean that's just rudimentary. C1 is 1 and c2 is 2. You get another curve that's given parametrically, and you have the expression, right? I mean if you want to plot it, you'll, you'll you know do the best. But you will see that again. There's always going to be this kind of behavior that it you're going tangent as t goes to infinity. You're going tangent to that eigen direction. Many of these things you can actually prove. You can take the derivative, take the derivative, and see what the derivative of this does as t goes to infinity. And you will see that the derivative that's a tangent vector is going to be exactly aligned in that direction, for instance. Okay? So we're less interested in individual curves, we're more interested in the whole picture. How is the picture looking like? Now, if, if we need to single out a curve, yeah, I mean, we're going to be... Sh uh, does it make sense? So how this... I mean, this, this construction actually is going to work basically for any um, system with repeated eigenvalues, or two by two system with repeated eigenvalues, and with only one eigenvector corresponding to that eigenvalue. So always going to get this uh, image, this picture. Now there is another way to kind of uh, get this uh, correspondence through changes of variables. So in other words, you can guess, you can you can figure out the face face portrait or face plane um, through really kind of focusing on the on the metrics itself. So oftentimes if you have a metric like that, you know, uh, the one above where you have repeated eigenvalues, then um, If we introduce new variables, y, okay, and that's going to get um, a little bit hairy as far as if you want to use little x and little y. So let me just um, 
stay with a capital Y that has two components, you know, could call it X tilde and Y tilde. Um, given by, uh, let's see, I want I want x to be equal to t times y, where t is a 2 by 2 matrix. Yeah. So we can always, I mean, we can always uh, change variables, right? But the question is, do you, uh, what what good would it do to this system? And can we find a change of variables that actually makes this simple. This uh, system looks looks simpler. And the answer is well, what happens with this system in the y variable? Then y satisfies the system. And let me write the system and then explain. So it's going to be t inverse a t y. So why is that? Well, it's very simple. X prime equals A X and just plug in T X uh, in uh, no, I'm sorry, T Y instead of X. Right? And you I mean use the fact that, that T is a fixed matrix, two by two matrix. So there is no T dependence. So this is capital T Y prime in the left side equals A T Y. And what we want is we want to be able to write Y prime. So we're just gonna multiply by T inverse, assuming T inverse exists. To the left side on both I mean to the left on both on both sides. So we're gonna I forgot to say, when I talk about change of variables, we want it to be invertible. So we want to do an invertible change of variables. Like this. Okay? So let me, so, of course this is a matrix, and this y prime is going to be uh, that matrix times y. So the goal is to have this matrix as simple as possible. Okay. So the goal is given a matrix, given a matrix A, find um, a change of variables, variables matrix T such that T inverse AT is as simple as possible. And that's achieved, you know, what does it mean as simple as possible? That's achieved by saying we want this to look either diagonal, so lambda mu zero zero, or If A has repeated eigenvalues, exactly this lambda 1, 0 lambda, so lambda on the diagonal, 1 above the diagonal, 0 below the diagonal. This is called canonical, well, all of these are called canonical forms, but this is called a Jordan block and uh, Sometimes it's not possible either of the two, but there is, so when there are complex roots, we're going to talk about next, or um, I think it's alpha, beta, minus beta, alpha. So all of these are called canonical forms. All of the above are called canonical forms.
So the idea is to bring it to a canonical form. And uh, there is actually a nice uh, result. I mean, linear algebra pretty much is all about saying, can this be, can this goal be achieved? And uh, at least for these two by two matrices, the answer is yes. Any given matrix, you'll be able to find a change of variables t, a matrix t, so that when you multiply to the left to t inverse a t, you end up with one of these three canonical forms. When you have two distinct eigenvalues, you're going to end up with the diagonal form. Two distant eigenvalues, right? For each eigenvalue, there's going to be an eigenvector. <coughs> so, in fact, it also says what t is. T, the matrix t is, consists on, on, on uh, columns of the eigenvectors. If, t ha if A has repeated eigenvalues, then you may end up with, with a diagonal if lambda and lambda is 0, 0. So if you have two eigenvectors corresponding to that eigenvalue. Or with this form, if you have only one, one eigenvector corresponding to the, uh, to the repeated eigenvalue. And if you have complex conjugate roots or, or eigenval eigenvalues, then uh, this is how the form looks like. Okay, so if A has repeated, uh, excuse me, d distinct eigenvalues, lambda and mu, say, then T is going to be can I write it like this? Um, columns of T consist of eigenvectors of A, of linearly independent eigenvectors, one, one for each eigenvalue. I'm sorry, let me, let me, let me do lambda 1 and lambda 2 so it's, it's clear what, what I mean. So these are real eigenvalues, then the eigenvectors correspond to Um, each eigenvalue you put it on on the, on the columns and you get you you get what then t inverse a t is going to be exactly lambda one lambda two zero zero so this is diagonal okay has has everybody seen this like why why this uh, matrix with the columns consisting of eigenvectors makes this work. <laughs> no? Yes? Hmm? Well, another way of writing this is is eight. Uh, excuse me. Is is um, at is t times lambda one zero zero lambda one lambda two. Okay. And take a look, AX1, which is the first column of T, is lambda 1, X1. So that's how the matrix multiplication works here. Take the first column of T, multiply by lambda 1. It, it basically says X1 is an eigenvector corresponding to lambda 1. And for the second eigen, uh, column, okay? So that's basically what, why it works, because you have Put the, put the eigenvectors on the columns. The really independent means the matrix is invertible. You can invert it. Okay, in other words, you wouldn't take an eigenvector x1 and twice the same eigenvector x1. Because then it would be a non-invertible matrix. The determinant would be zero. Okay? So that's 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 uh, again the first case. The second case is A has repeated eigenvalues in which case again the simple situation is, is there are two distant eigenvectors 
So let's say with only one, so the the not so simple case, with only one non-zero, uh, non, excuse me, with only one eigenvector. Then how do you think you're still going to be putting, so x1 is the only eigenvector, you're going to be putting the that eigenvector on the first column, and on the second column you're going to put a generalized eigenvector. And the claim is that t inverse a t is then lambda lambda 1 0. Again, why? Well, take a look. a t would have to be t times lambda 1 0 lambda. And let's look at the first column. First column of the, of the left side. This is going to be a x 1. On the left side, on the right side is lambda x1. Is that true? That's, that's true for x1. What, if, what about the second column? In the left side is a x2. In the right side is look, 1 times x1 plus lambda times x2. So it's x1 plus lambda x2. Again, that's how x2 is, all, is defined. Okay? So, as, as that example was, was uh, we computed that whole thing, so as we said 0, 1, negative 1, negative 2, then what will t be? Will be the first eigenvector, what was negative 1, 1? And the uh, generalized eigenvector was 0, negative 1? Or no? This matrix is invertible, right? It means the two the two x one x two are, are linearly independent. Right? And now I'm talking about x one superscript and x two superscript here. Again, if you want you can verify T inverse A T is is what it is, right? Is a, is a, is that canonical form. But, um, so now, this system, x prime equals ax, with a change of variables, becomes y prime equals t inverse a t times y. Okay? So this y prime is lambda 1, 0 lambda y. And for this we computed, we said um, the phase portrait, well, what was the only eigenvalue, eigenvector, 1 and 0. So this was the only eigenvector, eigendirection, right? Let's say lambda is negative, so it's, it's going towards the origin. So, so it's going like this, right? And how about the rest? What was the rest? The rest was like, um, so x1, excuse me, this, this would be y1 in this, because we're looking about y's. y1 was 1, 0. And actually y2 was, I think, 0, 1. Although this was not an eigenvector, but it was used in that solution. So the solution was looking like what? y of t is... Um, oh. We had it above. The picture was was like this. So if lambda was negative, um, okay. Uh, what is this? So it's c1 e to the lambda one lambda t one zero plus c2 t e to lambda t one zero plus 
e to the lambda t zero one. So what is what is what does it look like? Just let's say c1 is 0, again c2 is 1. So we want to look at this part. Is t to lambda t and e to lambda t? So it's t e to lambda t and e to lambda t. Is this something you can, you can um, plot other than parametric equation? I don't, well, you could you could solve for t from the second one, plug it in the first one, but it's going to be too messy. So the only the only thing is how do you plot it? Well, when t is zero, this is zero one, so it's zero one starts here, right? When t is increasing, the first component is positive, right? Everything everything is positive actually, as t is positive, so it goes towards the origin but it goes this direction right so it's, it's like this and of course you know, the negative side will go like this okay so this is in the y variables this is in that new variables the system looks like one, like very, very standard, like canon in the canonical form. So for the x, so this is the y variables, or the uh, y, the y, uh, the y um, uh, face, face plane, and the y variables. And the, we 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 saw like we saw how the, it looked like in the x variable. So what's the relation between the, between these two? Well, every point in this plane is related to the points in the in the in the y variable by this transformation, by this linear transformation. So many times we just put we say if we know the y the y picture we apply t to y and we get the x picture. Okay? And a linear transformation always um, does what? Keeps the zero because zero times a matrix is zero. Right? So if zero is a fix. And everything else is pretty much transformed, is like uh, deformed. Angles get deformed. Um, picture could be dilated by two, by 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 a certain factor, and so forth. If you, if you allow me, I'm going to put y one y one y two and x one x two. Although in other places we use x and y for the for the face plane. But if you put, just to clarify, x1, x2 here and y1, y2, um, then what was the actual transformation here? What was t? Well, t was this, so basically it was saying x1 is negative y1 and x2 is 1, y1 minus y2. I'm sorry to um, just want to make sure this is correct. So
do you see the problem here? Looks like x1 gets the opposite of y1. So the kind of the pattern should be the opposite. But I think it's going to end up looking the same. Should be correct. Let's just follow, for instance, one point, like 0, 1. 0, 1 is for y, so I'm going to have 0 for x, and um, negative 1 for y, right? So it's going to be this point. Yeah. So you see what happens is the... Okay, so... The, this is correct. It's just the, the change of variables actually flips the y1 axis, right? But then it flips somehow the x and y, the x1 y1, and then it deforms it. So, so these branches correspond to those branches. If you want to use different color, this corresponds to this branch. Okay. And this branch will correspond to this branch. Okay? So transformation is, you know, flips things around and. <clears throat> but the general um, pattern is the same. Okay? So finally, let's. Uh, so that, that's pretty much it for repeated eigenvalues. Okay? It's a lot more complicated than for, for um, uh, distinct real eigenvalues. But, and I didn't show you the picture here, but when you have distant eigenvalues, uh, the system for y looks really easy. It's just decoupled, right? So the system for y would have this as the metrics coefficient. So it'd be y1 is y1 prime is lambda one y1. Let me let me draw the picture here. So for uh, lambda one different from lambda two real, the y system is y prime equals lambda one lambda two zero zero y. So it's basically y1 prime is lambda one y1 y. 2 prime is lambda 2 y2. So what's the system looking like? In the y variables. Hmm? Depends on what lambda 1 positive or lambda 1 negative. But let's say lambda 1 is negative and lambda 2 is positive. Now lambda one negative means on the on the y one it goes toward the origin. <coughs> on the y two it goes away from the origin. And then here it goes like this, right? So it's not skewed or anything, it's just that's if it, that's because the matrix coefficient is diagonal. So what will, what will the x so this is the y variables? So the original variables will look again. You, it's whatever t is. I don't have an explicit, but t is going to be consisting of those two eigenvectors on columns. So, what will the green? you know, the green uh, curves correspond. Well, there's going to be 
wherever the x1 is, maybe it's like this, right? Maybe x1 is like this. The eigenvector corresponding to lambda 1. Where is x2? Um, well, it depends how x2 looks like. It may, it may look, it may be this, this direction, right? Well, so then how is, how is the solution uh, like this solution? Well, it's probably going to be deformed, you know, but still be in between those two uh, eigendirections. Or starting it, you know, from one eigendirection going to, to the other one. Okay? So you can, you can see that everything else is... like that okay. so every time that you know that's the message here is that every time you see this you have a you have a linear system as, as we saw last time in the pictures uh, that you can anticipate what the solution what the solution what the plane um, face plane look is going to look like Right. That's a, so. From the picture, you can almost well. It's the order is is the opposite. It's not from the picture you figure out whether there are two distant eigenvalues or whatever. Right. The the order is that you get the the, the metrics. You find the you know in what case you are, and then you can um, match with the picture. Right. Okay. Um, so let's see what happens when we have complex eigenvalues. What's an example of with complex eigenvalues? Um, of course, the standard one would be sort of 0, 1, negative 1, 0. Is what that's, that's called a rotation by 90 degrees, right? And you see this, you know, this circle. So that's x prime equals y y prime equals negative x. We talked about this, right? This has complex eigenvalues, and we'll, we'll compute them. Um, also, there are... This is not the only way you can get complex eigenvalues, right? You can get complex eigenvalues by... Um, I don't know, let me give this a shot here. Yeah. For instance, 0, 1, negative 1, and 1 for the metrics. Okay? Let's, let's compute those. Uh, let's compute these and... and um, so 3 would be the complex conjugate eigenvalues. So... Let's take this metric 0, 1, negative 1, 1. So the system will be x prime equals ax again. I want to compute a minus lambda identity. x equals, uh, no, sorry, determinant of this equals 0 with the eigenvalues. Minus lambda 1, negative 1, 1 minus lambda. Okay, so what do we get? Lambda, lambda minus 1, plus 1. Lambda square minus lambda plus 1 equals 0. So lambda 1, 2 is 1 half plus or minus square root of is it 3 halves? Square root of 3, 1 minus 4 over 2. Eigenvalues. So these are complex complex eigenvalues, right? And why are they conjugate? In other words, are we always going to get conjugate? Conjugate means plus or minus on the imaginary part. This is the real part, this is the imaginary part. Why do we always get complex conjugate? 
point. <laughs> it's a quadratic equation with the real coefficient. So the, the, the actual equation you're solving doesn't have complex coefficient because it comes from a matrix. And the, as long as the matrix has real entries, and that's the only matrix we're going to talk about really, is real entries. So the, when you write this out, it's going to be real coefficients. So if one complex root exists, then the conjugate of that complex root will also be a, a solution. Okay. So again, the key is A has is a real matrix, has real entries. In this course, we're only going to be talking about differential equations where the coefficients are real. Implies that um, lambda one and lambda two are complex conjugate. So it's always going to happen, for 2 by 2 case at least, that, out, that if you have a complex conjugate, complex root, then the, the solutions, the eigenvalues are alpha plus i beta and alpha minus i beta. So lambda 1 is alpha plus i beta, lambda 2 is alpha minus i beta. And beta is not 0, OK? So in this case, alpha is a half, and beta is whatever. Okay. So what do we do with this? Well, we're still trying to find solutions of the differential system. So um, complex valued uh, eigenvectors x1 corresponding to lambda 1, and there's going to be x2 corresponding to lambda 2, right? Well, if x1 corresponds to lambda 1, and uh, let's, let's give it a name to the real part and imaginary part. Uh, I think they use u and v. Is v1 and v2, which is uh, can I just use u and v? So I stick with index one is for the first eigenvalue. Then for the second eigenvalue, so so this is corresponding to lambda equals lambda 1, then for this, the claim is that if you take the complex conjugate of this, minus i times v, this is corres corresponds to lambda equals lambda 2, which is the complex conjugate of the first one. So if I have complex, a pair of complex conjugate eigenvalues, then I can write a pair of complex conjugate eigenvectors. Problem is, these eigenvectors are complex valued. They have complex. They have this number i in it. So in principle, we could be we could be writing x one of t to be e to the lambda one t x one and x2 of t, which is e to the lambda 2 t x2, are two solutions. And they're a complex conjugate of x prime equals ax. But they're complex valued. They, they have. So I've started with a system that has no complex numbers. It's a real system. And we found solutions that are complex value. They have a real part and imaginary part. So we cannot really stop here. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to say, take 
um, u1 to be the real part of x1 of t and v1 to be the complex part, uh, excuse me, imaginary part of x1. Then we have x1 is u1 of, of t plus i v1 of t and x2 would be the complex conjugate of, of, of this, so it's going to be u1 minus v. Okay? So there's going to be two. The claim is that these u1 and v1 are also solutions. But this time they're real. Okay? Let's see, why, why, is, why is u1 a solution? If x1 is a solution, x2 is a solution to that system, original system. You see, you can write u1 to be the half the sum. Or well, the sum of the two solutions, x1, x2, is twice u1. And the system is linear, so we can, if, if we have two solutions, the sum will also be a solution, right? So the fact that u1 and the same with v1, so this is x1 plus x2 over 2, and v1 is x1 minus x2 over 2i are both solutions of the of the system a prime equals a x. But what's the big advantage of u1 and v1 versus x1 and x2? They're real values. So they're only I mean there are only real numbers in it. What's the disadvantage? They won't look as pretty as x1 and x2. x1, x2, you can take a look. x1 and x2 is just is like 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 x like lambda one and lambda two are real. It's the same formula. Of course, lambda one here is complex. So what's e to a complex number? It's going to be a complex number, right? It's going to ha it's going to have. So let's see. Let's let's do this. X one is e to the lambda one t x one. So this is going to be e to the alpha plus i beta t x one e to the alpha t plus i beta t x one. What's e to the a real plus an imaginary part? Hmm? Said so Euler. Cosine and sine, right? So it's of course you can you can uh, do this and now say that e to the i theta is cosine theta plus i sine theta. Right? That's Euler's formula. So e to the alpha t cosine beta t plus i sine beta t x one. And now look x one is it itself is u1 plus i v1 so it's it's it has an, a real part and an imaginary part so you can see this whole thing has to be multiplied through to find the real part of x1 and the imaginary part of x1 so let's let's just do that really quick so it's going to be e to the alpha t cosine beta t u1 minus e to the alpha t sine beta t v1 that's the real part plus i times e to the alpha t sine beta t u1 plus e to the alpha t cosine beta t v1 so that's the the two solutions are going to be like this e to the alpha t cosine beta t u1 minus e to the alpha t sine beta t v1 and the second one v1 is going to be e to the alpha t sine beta t u1 plus e to the alpha t cosine beta t v1 
Now, what, what is left to do is to say that these two are linearly independent solutions. So one is not a multiple of the other. Now I'm going to leave that for you to check. Like, what, what, what would happen if, this, if, you, if one would be the constant multiple of the other? Um, and then the general solution is going to be a constant multiple of u1 plus another constant multiple of u1. And that's, that's the solution. Now, um, I was telling you that even if it's canonical for, I mean, even if it's complex conjugate roots, there is a canonical form and it has that specific um, so in canonical form x prime equals ax becomes y prime equals t inverse a t y where T inverse AT is of the form um, alpha, beta, minus beta, and alpha. Okay, and how do you how can you see that uh, really easily? Well, probably the easiest would be to to um, To do the following is to say that a times um, x1 is alpha plus i beta x1 and rewrite this as u the real part and the imaginary part let me just say u and v equals alpha plus i beta u plus iv so you can see a u equals what alpha u plus or minus beta v and what is a v is going to be beta u plus alpha v okay, okay. we're running out of time again but um, If you do the same, instead of A, but the canonical form with T inverse, so it's going to be just T inverse AT, T inverse AT, um, you're going you're gonna to end up with T inverse AT to be alpha, beta, minus beta, and alpha. Okay. So again, the um, face portraits of any matrix that has complex eigenvalues is going to be a transformation or a change of variables from one of the standard ones, this being the standard ones. And you have sinks or sources, but it's, all spir it's always spiraling in because it has sines and cosines in exponential terms. Okay? Uh, so I, I put the sort of the homework due on Friday, but it's the 13th, so <laughs> watch out. Just uh, if you have done it by Wednesday, you know, just turn it in. Uh, just by five, I don't care, but.